Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India A very warm welcome to all of you in this course titled Development Processes and Social Movements and uh, today we are going to have the lecture number 17 of uh, this course which is titled as Women's Movements and LGBT Issue. So to begin with I would like to tell you first of all how to contextualize the issue. So as you can see that it is the women's movement so of course we will be talking about the issues related to women in general and uh, so we will have it in two contexts one the broader context I will talk about the global scenario but our major focus will be on India so here I have uh, divided this into four phases the first phase is the age of social reforms second phase is during the national freedom struggle third is post independence in 1960s and 70s and fourth is post liberalization in 1990s. So let me begin with what do I talk about in the age of social reforms. So during the social reforms primarily we talk about the works done by Raja Ram Mohan Roy, how he fought against the Sati Pratha, then he also advocated for the widow remarriage. Then other than Raja Ram Mohan Roy, two three names which are even more important are Jyotiba Phule and Savitri Bai Phule, the, they were husband and wife and in the context of Maharashtra, they worked for, uh, the, for the women's education in general and especially the girl children's education. So uh, we remember Jyotiba Phule and Savitri Bai Phule for their contribution for mass education, especially girls education and they had established an organization called Satya Shodhak Samaj. Though we study about Satya Sodhak Samaj more uh, into when we study about the caste reforms or say the reforms of Dalit. But here I have mentioned it about the social reforms. Along with these two, uh, Yotiba Phule and Savitri Bai Phule, even Pandita Rama Bai, she played an important role and she worked for the widows. Uh, she had established Sarda Sadan in Maharashtra. She also established Mukti Sadan. So whenever it will come to the issue of women's reform things and who all worked for women, then the contribution of Savitri Bai Phule and Pandita Rama Bai is something that we must learn about. So in all these social reforms, it was the women's question which was the central concern. Now coming to the second phase that is during the national freedom struggle, it was the role by a role played by Sarojini Naidu, Kamla Devi Chattopadhyay, Preeti Vadedar etc who played important role in Indian National Congress. So while women started joining the Indian National Movement, the major role played by Gandhi as a leader is very important because what he did is that his use of religion and morality into politics, it attracted women in large number. So what we get to see is that, that in Indian National Movement, the the role of women increased many fold and, and in a large number women started joining the movement. So uh, a major contribution for this goes to Mahatma Gandhi. Third is uh, the third now we come to the post independence and the post independence period I have divided into two phases. So one is the 60s and 70s and the other one is 1990s onwards. So in 60s and 70s we get to see that the women were fighting against alcoholism because whenever the men drink or when they take liquor then we get to see the case of domestic violence because then they tend to beat their wives. Another issue is that of dowry, often hear about things like dowry deaths uh, or major demands for dowry that leads to uh, the, the marriages get to fail. So these are the things like alcoholism, dowry, domestic violence, etc. These all are interlinked. So this is the time when we talk about that the private sphere, that is the sphere of family, was now being discussed in public sphere. So the issues related to women is not just about women, but they are also about 
what do the men do so for instance if the men will have uh, if they will have the consumption of alcohol or liquor then that will affect women uh, and another thing was that their participation in chipko andolan uh, in in the next lecture in the le lecture 18 when you will study about environmental movements there also you will get to learn about people like say gora devi who played an important role in chipka chipko andolan or even uh, for instance here i haven't mentioned uh, narmada bachao because that was in 1980s because medha patkar played an important role in narmada bachao andolan so these are the women who played important role uh, for uh, the women to come forward in the last phase, the fourth phase that I have talked about is post-liberalization. In here, I have mentioned about the Narmada movement. So, Narmada movement is an environmental movement. Other than that, we get to see the rise of Dalit feminism that although there was this Dalit movement in general, but within that, there was also an emergence of Dalit feminism uh, in order to question whether uh, the voice of women is being heard in the Dalit movement or not, or whether the women should have their own voice in uh, as a notion of Dalit feminism. Then third thing I have mentioned is LGBT issue and later on in the slides I will be telling you about LGBT but let me quickly here mention the full form of LGBTQ and some of you must have heard of lesbian, gays, bisexual, transgender and queer. So these uh, category of the, um, like the base um, based on the sex that this identity politics has now taken a new uh, shape whether homosexuality is a sin whether people should be allowed to marry or not because these are the things which lead to a different notion of family a different notion of uh, say the idea of property etc. So uh, we will be learning about all these in our upcoming slides and these were the four phases I wanted to tell you. So you can as see that this is from 19th century to the ongoing debates. So now I have divided the things into century wise. For example here in the next slide that I come to is women's issues in 19th century. So in 19th century what were the major challenges? The major challenges were things like Sati Pratha, maybe some of you must have heard of Sati Pratha that the women were forced to like when if the husband died then on the pyre even the woman will be forced to uh, take up death. So it's not that they chose it but it was forced upon them. So that was Sati Pratha and next was child marriage that uh, for instance at the age of 5 or 7 uh, the girls or even boys so when we say child marriage then it was affecting both the boys as well as girls then the issue of widow remarriage that uh, the widows were not allowed to marry and here it is interesting to know that the men were um, allowed to marry if the if the wife will die then a man can marry but the same thing does not apply to the women so widow remarriage was something which was considered quite as a taboo and it was not allowed in the society similarly there was no access to education so uh, women were not uh, uh, educated properly and the girl children were not given adequate uh, facility for education so coming to Jyotiba and Savitri Bai Phule, they had a major contribution as I mentioned it to you in the previous slide also and the organization that they established is uh, named Satya Shodhak Samaj which was established in 1873. So maybe you should remember this year 1873 when Satya Shodhak Samaj, Satya Shodhak Samaj. Here I, I have missed to mention this organization but you should know about this organization which played an important role. So Fule established this in 1873. So what was the major contribution that it led to mass education for women and girls. Then Pandita Ramabai I mentioned again in the previous slide but she established three institutions. One was Arya Mahila Samaj the first institution. Second was Sharda Sadan and third I have not mentioned but I am writing it here which is Mukti Sadan. So Pandita Ramabai in her lifetime she did lot many things and the major contribution was institution building and uh, there was something called Ramabai circle 
so she had visited uh, england as well as america so in those days it was not that easy to travel abroad but that way rama bai was fortunate that she had this opportunity to go to these two countries then by rama bai circle she tried to raise money so she was doing uh, she raised money as a pub, uh, then she did the public sector works for instance uh, something for the widows as well as for the girl children to educate them then to the widows she was also giving them training in order to have them as self sufficient beings for instance if they learned sewing or they learned things like say, stitching or uh, making handicrafts then those are the things which gave them employment they were able to earn for themselves so that was another contribution by rama bai that is to make them economically self sufficient other than these two uh, the phule husband and wife as well as pandita rama bai it was mg rana day's wife rama bai rana day who was close to pandita rama bai she also played an important role in sensitizing women in maharashtra and she also advocated women's education and their rights so these are the issues so you can now see that in the public arena now the women were more in number and the issue of education was something which was being talked about that they need to have education and then second issue is employment so how will you empower the women so these two are the major issues that if you will educate them and if you will give them a chance for employment so this was the 19th century now we come to the first half of 20th century why have i uh, called it first half of 20th century because india was not independent until 1947 so here we have focused more upon the pre independence days as in what were the problems faced by women or what were the women's issues at that time so first of all there was this nationalist question so what is nationalist question that is the making of india as a nation so where there what will be the role of women so that was the issue that in the freedom struggle what is the role that the women will have so for that first of all national council for women in india ncwi this if you will see then uh, this national council for women for the first time it it was like in 1926 so it is the mid 1920s and it was being realized that we need to have a special attention on women's issues so that's why this organization was set up then another organization came up in 1927 as you can see that there is a gradual you know numerous uh, institutions came up so that second one was all india women's conference so that was set up in uh, in pune in 1927 so in this all india women's conference this issue of women's was debated and discussed that what could be the ways to have the betterment of their lives then it was in 1929 that the sarda act was passed the sarda act is very important because there the age of marriage was raised for instance earlier it was the girls of just 8 to 10 years who were married or say even very early at the age of even 6 or 7 they were married so now it was fixed 14 for girls and 18 for boys and uh, you must be knowing that for now it is 18 years for girls and 21 years for boys so there was this kind of gradual increase in this age so uh, for that time that is for 1929 even the age of 14 years for girls was something which many girls were married at the age of 10 itself or at or even below 10 so in that sense we should learn about sarda act or we should remember that it was sarda act which raised the years the age then from 1917 to 1942 during this period of say around 25 years the issue of women's representation was being debated as in whether uh, women should also have right to vote because you must be knowing that in the west uh, the women got right to vote much later for instance ever since britain started having elections it is not that the women were allowed to uh, have right to vote women got right to vote much later even in countries like new zealand and australia so it was only in the 1920s that many countries worldwide 
uh, the women got their right to vote. So now when such things were happening in other countries, then it was debated whether in India they should also have representation rights or not. So it was in 1930s that along with representation or political representation, now the issue of inheritance, whether the girl child should also have property. For instance, whatever property that the father or forefathers have, what amount of money will be given to the girl child? So, and how will it be affected by the marriage? For example, you must be aware that the dowry is considered as the share of girl child because at the time of marriage, the father gives certain amount of uh, their wealth to the girl children. So now it was being said that whether dowry should be seen as a way of inheritance or not. Then second issue was about the reforms in personal laws because different religions, for example, especially uh, Islam, has this different notion of personal laws, issues related to talaq or issues related to uh, well, in the old age, what kind of rights will the women have. So for to, to resolve these things, uh, here we find that there, there is this root of uniform civil code, UCC. So if we will have uniform civil code, then for all the women, be it the Hindu women or Muslim women or Christian women, there should be similar rule. For instance, what will be the amount of money that they will get as their family, as their property. So things related to property, things related to marriage and other things. So if we consider women as one category, then that will be the major thing behind uniform civil code. But there is no unanimity on a uniform civil code and that's why so far we haven't had a uniform civil code. Then this uh, last point that I have mentioned is recognition of equality for women. So we had this right to vote in our Indian constitution and uh, that is something which is a major achievement you can say because ever since India became an independent country, we have this right to vote for women which was not the case in countries like say UK, US, New Zealand or Australia. So that way India as a country is considered progressive when it comes to uh, its role vis-a-vis -vis women. So women got the right to vote since beginning itself. So India became independent and in the constitution right to vote for women was mentioned. Then we come to women's movements in post-independence period. So now we have learned a bit about the pre-independence days and you can see the continuity, how there is a continuity but there is also a discontinuity as in there are some changes in the post-independence period. So first of all there was the Shahada movement in the Adivasi areas of Maharashtra. It was, I haven't mentioned the years but most probably it was in the 1950s that was against the harassment by the local landlords. So suppose the way the local landlords were treating the women, especially the tribal women, that the Shahada movement started. Shahada movement also had, it led to the formation of Shramik Sangathan. So the issue of working class, so one was about the issue of women, women, then next is working class. So here I would like to tell you that when we talk about the notion of rights, then sometimes we cannot just disentangle or we cannot keep the issues of women separately because the issues of workers is also related to issues of women. So this organization, Shramik Sangathan in 1972, it took turns and from social reform, it led to Sarvode and to a far left one. So that means we can see that there is a gradual shift. So in the beginning, it was about social reforms, that there should be a slow and steady social reform. What do we mean by Sarvodaya? Sarvodaya is the upliftment of all. Upliftment of all. Because Sarvodaya is Sarv, means all. Uday means upliftment. Sabhi ka uday, that is Sarvodaya. So if we will talk about Sarvodaya ideology, that means the tribals were talking about the upliftment of the entire community. And from there, how did it move to far left one? 
is because Sarvodaya has a Gandhian ideology in its root. But if it moves too far left, then it will have an inclination which you can have a Maoist inclination or even the Naxalism kind of thing. Because the major difference is that in the Gandhian ideology, it is based on non-violence. So, Sarvodaya will always be based on non-violence. But when we will talk about fa uh, the left one, then it may turn into violent one. So, this use of violence or non-violence is something that demarcates these two phases that in Sarvodaya, there will be no violence. So, that is we call non-violence. But when we move to left, for instance, the Naxals, they often use arms. So, these are the things we got to remember. So, other than this Shahada movement, there was another organization called Seva. Seva, many of you must have heard of. The full form of Seva is Self-Employed Women's Association. That was established by Ila Bhatt. And Ila Bhatt is a, a renowned uh, Gandhian social reformer. So, Seva was established in 1972 in Ahmedabad, Gujarat and it is, it is guided by Gandhian principles. So, one of the major contributions of Seva has been that it is a kind of uh, you can say small scale industries have been promoted by Seva. Then it is a kind of self-reliant economy, it is something that it looks forward to. Then the next issue is that of anti-price rise agitation in Gujarat and Maharashtra and here I have not mentioned Bihar but even in Bihar because when JP led his movement then women also came forward to participate in that and in JP movement other than uh, corruption or say anti-congress movement it was this issue of inflation or, or the price rise was a major issue. So, this anti-price rise agitation because whenever there is a hike in the prices of commodities, then it tends to affect the women in a major way. So, in Gujarat and Maharashtra in 1970s, there was this new forum which was made which was called United Women's Anti-Price Rise Front. This organization, it mainly aimed at anti-price rise because they were opposing this price rise for instance things like sugar or all the food crops these were the things that were getting expensive and it was affecting women. So what they did is that they tried to mobilize the women and they asked them to come together under this umbrella which was United Women's Anti-Price Rise Front. Next organization was which we call as POW, P -O -W, which is Progressive Organization of Women. This POW POW, it was formed in 1974 in Hyderabad and it actually addressed two major issues. One was the gendered division of work and second was the culture of patriarchy. So culture when we say and when we talk about patriarchy, then that addresses the larger way of looking at society that if there will be patriarchy, then all the other things will always be guided by patriarchy. And when we talk about gender division of work, then we know that in the family, all the household works are expected by women to do or the works which are to be done outside. So this inside, outside or you can say the, the private sphere and public sphere, how do we divide between the two? So there is a gendered division of work that it is the men who will go to work outside and they will earn and come back. But what happens when the women also become working women? So if they are working women, they are also going to work outside. But then when they come back, they are expected to do all the household works also. So in that sense, it becomes a double labor for women, which is not the case with men. So now gradually this thing was being said that if the women are also working, then men should also share some household works. So this was the gender division of work or for instance, second issue is that of rearing the child, who will take care of the child, then it is the mothers who are expected to do more the work. So that is another issue that how uh, these are the responsibilities which are to be shared by men and women. So. This is the shift that you can see that from 
price rise to making women self sufficient to gender division of work these were the issues now being talked about so while in the 19th century or say in the pre independence days it was the issue of representation it was the issue of uh, child marriage or sati pratha now you can see there is a shift in the issues and now uh, now that women are already in the forefront or if the women are already uh, into the public places if they are working then the debate was also changing a bit now coming to the next issue which i have talked about galvanization of women's groups why have i called it galvanization of women's groups is because there were different kinds of issues which were being talked about women some issues were related to uh, if they now become the working women or what should be the rights of women those who are the working women they become the mothers so by the 1970s and 80s two major issues which came up were rape and dowry because these were the two major issues faced by women because there were cases of rapes numerous cases of rapes all over the country and there were also the dowry deaths so now what happened is that there was this forceful campaign around these two issues that the women need to be united and they need to fight for themselves so they in a way devised their ways of resistance how to resist so there were public campaigns there were protest marches there were street plays there were posters which were displayed so these were the ways to raise consciousness now when i mention this word consciousness then the consciousness of not just the women but also the men because if the men will not know that these are the problems then just women knowing those problems will not help so suppose if there are problems related to dowry or if there is a issue like domestic violence so only if the men will understand then they can stop doing uh, something like domestic violence or they will stop uh, having the consumption of of liquor so street plays were another very important way of sensitizing the people that through street plays they were giving the messages or uh, the children themselves learning about the issues related to women now regarding dowry what happened is that the laws related to dowry they came under the criminal laws and like other criminal laws they are bound to be limited in its effectiveness so in case of dowry we don't see much success and again for dowry uh, a more important role will be played only if the people understand that the something like dowry is not good for society for let me just explain it to you how does dowry function uh, ever since the birth of a girl child we start saving the money in order to give them as a dowry but instead of saving that money as a dowry if we give them a chance to study then they can also become uh, working women so how will this function because when you give another chance to your son or the boy child because for them becoming earning is a must but for a girl it is like if she works then fine if she doesn't work getting a husband who will earn well is the logic behind dowry and another logic is that the father gives a certain amount of uh, share of his property to the girl child uh so how was this functioning so other than these protest marches public campaigns etc there was this need to have public legal education that people should have this legal awareness what are the uh, rights that the women have or even say community action and sensitization campaigns so about the dowry and rape kind of thing these are the things which are likely to help much more then this is one thing that i wanted to mention that in 1971 this towards equality report came up and this report was made by this committee on the status of women so when this committee was formed in the late 1960s it had to study the condition of girls and women now uh, the level of their education to the age of their marriage or things like dowry etc and this towards equality report in 1971 it became a major turning point and now it was being seen that whatever we do for instance when we do the budget when we make the budget then there also there should be something like what component of the budget is allocated to the women 
So we get to see that it was um, from the sixth five year plan that something like gender budgeting started that we consider the needs of women as a separate category and a certain amount of um, allocation of budget is done for the women. Then this forum against rape was set up in uh, 1981 in Mumbai. So uh, you can see that in from 70s to 80s how are we moving and all of you must have heard of Nirbhaya case. So in case of Nirbhaya which happened quite recently like now it's 8 to 10 years old case where the safety of women at public places was being debated that is are the public places safe for women and girls or not. So now what has happened is that from education to employment now we talk about safety. So these are you can see that there is a shift in the issues around women. So these were the issues that I wanted to talk about in this slide regarding women's groups. Now the next slide I have mentioned as important cases, issues and instances. So let me again quickly go back to 80s and 90s. There was a case of Sati which took place in 1987 in Rajasthan. So by that time Sati was not something which we were hearing quite often but it happened as one instance in Rajasthan and that led to a lot of debate whether it is a good thing or bad thing because there was this support to this case within the Rajput community because it was considered as an example of self-sacrifice. What if a woman wants to die? When the husband has died, then woman also decides to die. So whether that woman should be allowed to die or not. Now here there was this issue of revival of a tradition because whether the community is forcing the woman to go for death or the woman is just uh, she is having a self-considered notion that she wants to die because for instance if she loves her husband so much that if the husband is no more then the, uh, then the uh, that woman the widow would not like to live. So this what happened is that the entire community got divided into two groups because now it was being said that there is this group of traditional Hindu woman versus alienated westernized feminist woman. Because it was said that those who are the western they will say that no there should be nothing like tradition. So whether we look at Sati Pratha as something as a revival of tradition that was another issue. But then as Sati Pratha was banned so again we cannot start it cannot become again a new practice in the modern age. Then second issue was that of issues of culture and tradition as well as communities and representation. So representation was another issue that in the modern setup how women will be representing themselves. So whether that should be guided by the tradition or it should be guided by modernity. Now if we talk about healthcare and other issues related to say malnutrition then mostly we get to see that the women they give primacy to the male counterpart in the family like if there is good food then what amount of food will go to the males or say even the burden of work for example the when the women work tirelessly at home then that work is not counted we do not consider like of course there is no like they are not paid for that and there is no recognition also they, it is often said that uh, what do they do they hardly do anything so this burden of work in uh, public and private sphere for instance things like collecting water to fodder and fuel are not recognized as work. So this also became another issue because then what happens is that the women are likely to fall sick if they will not eat well, if they will not get enough time to take rest then these are the things which uh, lead to uh, their health issues. Then another issue is that of female feticide that before the birth of girl children there is this female feticide that uh, people want to have just son not daughters so that leads to another problem and if, when they are born and they are married then sometimes they have to go through domestic violence or they have to go through dowry deaths so you will see how the society is in a way there is this kind of gender unjust society so the women are likely to suffer more vis-a-vis -vis men. So this issue for equal pay for equal work, 
So what happens is that if you will go and see the things at construction site, then those who employ the laborers, they prefer to have the male laborers because they will say that the male labor will carry say 8 to 10 bricks, but if the woman will take, she will be able to take only 4 to 6 bricks. So why should we pay uh, the women also equal as men? So they would certainly prefer the men more. So what happened is that this equal pay for equal work that at a workplace sometimes if the women are working then if the children are home sometimes they may ask for that the working hours should be little lesser or if the child is not well then the woman has to go home early. So these were some of the issues that how to consider this equal pay for equal work. Then another issue was that of maternity leave. Because when a mother, uh, when a girl, uh, when a woman becomes mother, in that process she needs to have uh, a certain amount of leave so that she goes through this process of giving birth to a child or to take care of the child. So maternity leave was another issue. Other than that, there was this issue of right to abortion. For instance, if a woman doesn't want to carry a child, so whether the woman should be allowed for abortion or not, or in the family how many children to have it's something it is mostly decided by the entire family and not necessarily the woman will have her say because mostly it is the husband who decides whether to have two children or three children something like that so this is right to abortion is another thing for which the women have been fighting now i have mentioned shah Bano case maybe some of you must have heard of shah Bano case this is a famous case in uh, regarding the muslim community because this was about the issue of divorce and settlement so this was about muslim women's protection bill whether they should be given the things like money for a certain maintenance because what happened is that in this case it was being said that the supreme court has endangered islam because the, there is something like personal law and Islam has its own way of making its own uh, laws. So the Supreme Court should not interfere. So that way Shah Bano case brought this issue of Muslim women because whether Muslim women feel safe in their marriage and what kind of things about the divorce, how should that take place. Can they have divorce and if they will get divorce then what amount of compensation will they get. Then another is this Bhavri Devi case. Bhavri Devi case took place in 1992 in Rajasthan and that was the case of rape. So in this what happened is that this case was going on in the court for a very long time and then recently the Supreme Court has now set guidelines that what should be the, uh, the laws for the guidelines for sexual harassment at the public places. These cases have in a way shaped the way of women's reforms in India. Then last issue that I have mentioned is about rights of sex workers, the life of those sex workers in the red light areas. Most of the cities have red light areas, especially the big cities like say Delhi, Mumbai and Banaras. So if you will go and see such areas, then mostly these areas are prohibited. The people who are uh, considered to be uh, what we say cultured people we don't even visit those areas but if you will go and see the uh, the lives that they live it is usually uh, recently that movie Gangu Bai you many of you must have heard of uh, in which Alia Bhatt is there so that movie depicts the how the uh, red light areas are such vulnerable places and how do women live there now we come to the issue of women in environmental movements and this thing I have mentioned in one of the first slides also that in the movements like Chipko, Narmada, Plachimada, etc. and Niamgiri, most of the environmental movements women have played important role. So within that there are two wings, one is the eco-feminism led by Vandana Shiva and feminist environmentalism led by Bina Agrawal. And I have mentioned about these issues in another like you have a chapter on environmental movements there also I have talked about but here I will just define these two in one one line. So eco-feminism argues that it is the colonialism which commercialized India's forest and it disrupted the traditional nurturing kind of relationship in which women and nature were interlinked. So the forests were being taken care of by the women. On the other hand, feminist environmentalism 
feminist environmentalism questions the unduly romanticized picture so what happens is that feminist environmentalists they tend to attack the eco feminists so these are two different ways of looking at environment whether women and nature are interlinked or there is something else so feminist environmentalists say that the indian society has its own ways of power domination control and hierarchy and we cannot say that the nature and women are something interlinked because there is a notion of power because uh, even within the women there will be rich women and poor women so both the rich and the poor women will not have access to environment in the same way uh, or for instance domination for that matter there, that can be based on caste as well so earlier i told you about class about the rich and uh, poor women similarly there can be a brahmin women and there can be a dalit women so uh, the notion of brahmin women will not be the same as that of dalit women so what happens is that bina agrawal tends to criticize vandana shiva for essentializing women nature relationship and saying this that it is not possible that all over the world nature and women are linked in the same way now next slide i have uh, mentioned about dalit feminism dalit feminism is you can say it is a new and it was only in the 1990s that we started talking about dalit feminism so how did this dalit feminism emerge it was like you can say an indian counterpart of black feminism because so we can have a parallel between black feminism and dalit feminism so what happened is that that it is the intersectionality approach intersectionality means within the community within the society there are different sections and we need to discuss that class caste gender these are the different dimensions within society and how will we interlink them so what happened is that it was being said that the black women in usa they face the problems and as the white women are then the black women face a different kind of problem so similarly it was being talked that even in india the dalit women face different kind of problem and especially the writings of shamila rege because she has written about this issue of caste and gender so you should you read her writing caste and gender by shamila rege so what dalit feminism says is that it asks us to have a gendered perspective of caste it says that just saying that the brahmin dalit etc is not enough we have to consider the gender issue as well so this new another organization was set up which is national federation of dalit women nfdw it tends to attack the brahmanical patriarchy that it is the brahmanical patriarchy which is responsible and the roots of this goes back to ambedkar so when ambedkar was criticizing endogamy that the system of marrying only within the caste it's something which is prevalent in the caste system in south asia so caste system tends to perpetuate itself so it keeps going on from one generation to another so what happened is that dalit women's participation in ambedkarite movement was one issue then there was this rise of dalit bahujan perspective and you must heard of mayawati's bahujan samajwadi party so there within the political party if a woman leader because mayawati was being seen as a dalit woman leader so that led to empowerment of dalit women so that was another issue which uh, in a way empowered this notion of dalit feminism so here in the last point i have mentioned that there are autobiographies the women writing their own experiences that being a dalit woman how the life has been difficult for them or the things like say debates and discussions about the issue of uh, dalits so caste and gender here what i have written what i have written here is also the last point that i have mentioned so interlinkages between caste and gender other so how do we get to know is about through debates discussions rise in literature so these are the things we need to keep in mind when we talk about dalit feminism now we come to the lgbt issue so what is lgbt issue as i already told you the full form is lesbian gays bisexual transgender and queer because this is the issue regarding identity issue and it was in 1980s that 
this global kind of an understanding started happening that we need to discuss this issue of homosexuality because our earlier notion of male and female as the only two categories was something now being questioned because not everyone fits into the category of men and women and some of you must have heard of the word hijra hijra is the word that we use in indian context but within that also there are different uh, notions because lesbians are actually the girls or women who have orientation towards the women themselves so same sex the both the females being attracted towards each other similarly gays if both are male uh, if both of them are men and attracted towards each other so they are called the gays so before this term lgbt came up then we used to call them the gay community but now it is called the lgbt community or lgbtq so why did this issue became important is that we call it third gender rights that there is something called third gender other than just the men and women whom we call the first and second so there is a third gender so all these are clubbed in one category which is third gender rights so what are they fighting for they are fighting for equity justice and unity if they are also human beings then it is the issue of human rights for them so what has happened is that organizations like human rights law network hrln then there is another organization called hum safar trust stree sangam these are the organizations which have worked for this lgbt issue and they have been fighting for making this homosexuality as something which is not a crime so it was actually let me just mention it quickly that it was section 377 of indian penal code indian penal code was made in 1860 so those were our colonial days so here i have mentioned whether it is a colonial hangover so this section 377 of ipcc had considered that same sex love is something which is an offense so how to decriminalize homosexuality that is the issue that we get to learn about in lgbt so what are the contemporary debates so it was in 1990s that gender just laws were being demanded and it was an impact of global debates because worldwide now identity issue was something which was around this third gender and there were so what happened is that this organization amnesty international which is a worldwide known international ngo in 1994 they accepted that if such people who have a different sexual orientation if they are attacked then that is an infringement of human rights so their problems were for the first time recognized under this human rights issue and since then the debate started that what kinds of exclusions do they face so it was said that they face exclusions of different kinds especially four types of exclusion they face social exclusion they face economic one cultural exclusion as well as political exclusion so do they have political rights or not can they do they have right to vote whether they can have representation rights for themselves another problem that they faced was that the lack of communication they were unable to express their identity and sometimes if they tell their identity publicly then there are lesser chances of getting employment or even to continue their education so they face discrimination at different places be it educational institutions or the workplace etc so such derogatory kind of uh, remarks for them that they are not considered equal is so that is why these issues like uh, lesbian rights so in women's movement we have to discuss about this issue of lesbian rights as well so that is something that i wanted to tell you and that's why i have clubbed this issue of lgbt issue with uh, women's rights so overall to summarize it was about decriminalization of homosexuality that it should not be considered as a criminal activity then uh, off late they are even um, fighting for their marriage rights etc whether they can marry whether they can adopt children or not so it is the issue of inheritance etc which are there now we come to the challenges to the women's movement 
So as we have discussed so far, the category of women is far too universal and undifferentiated. So actually the women are having different groups because they are divided on the basis of caste, on the basis of community, class, etc. Because there will be Hindu women and Muslim women, so they will not have the same kind of issue. Similarly, there will be rich women and poor women, so they will not have the same kind of issue. So if they come together for women's movement, how will they do it? So that is one of the major challenges that there, are, there is a kind of heterogeneity within women. Then uh, there was this role of women in anti-mandal agitation. So what happened is that the women got divided. So those who were in the favor of reservation and those who were uh, uh, opposing the reservation. Uh, similarly, in the Hindutva campaigns, when uh, Ram Jan Bhumi construction uh, kind of thing, when uh, Babri Masjid was being demolished, then uh, when uh, the Hindu militants were there, so women also were trying to uh, join them in large numbers. So you, you get to see that there are women who are the pro-Hindutva kind of uh, activity they are involved in and, and similarly they oppose them. So that is the thing that there is ideological divides among women. There are Hindu right wing who talk about Sri Dharma or say things like the Savarna's issue or whether there should be Kanyadan or not. Then there are conventional left groups that the women who have the communist orientation. So these are the issues we have to understand that there are ideological divides among women. Then there is this left movement and its exclusion of caste and gender. So although in India we get to see there are left political parties, but they have not been able to address the women's issue adequately. So that is another issue which the women's movement raised that the left politics in India have not done its, uh, it ha they have not given the due to the women community. Uh, another issue is regarding the Uniform Civil Code UCC. So uh, I had mentioned about Uniform Civil Code in the beginning that if all the women are considered as one category be it, be it Hindu women or Muslim women and all if we will have a homogeneous category but there is no such thing in India and so what happens is that for instance there is a scholar named Flavia Agnes who says that there is more of a majority communalism. And what is majority communalism that if all the Hindu women will get united so and the Muslim women are separate then how can we talk about something like uniform civil code. For a country like India it is very difficult to have something like uniform civil code. Then if we talk about quota for women then the issue comes about quota within quota that there should be SC quota for women, there should be OBC quota for women and that is the problem because of which even though the demand for quota started, uh, we could not have it for the political representation in a major way. Uh, another issue is that of question of funding, who will fund the women's movement, whether they should be funded by the international donors or it should be by the government. So this is the last point that I had mentioned about the funding. Now coming to the important achievements, what are the achievements that the women's movement have? One is the PNDT Act. PNDT Act is prenatal diagnostic techniques which was passed in 1994 and it was amended in 2002. So through this act female feticide was banned. So this we can consider as one of the major achievements of women's movement. Second is that of prevention of domestic violence act. So it was in 2005 that this act came up by which domestic violence has been completely banned. So for instance if there is any case of domestic violence then the women can go and report about the same to the police. Uh, third issue is that of reform in Hindu code bill. So now there is inheritance rights for women and now women can also claim for their property in their father's property. So we cannot say that just dowry is enough because even after marriage the women can claim for their ancestral property. Fourth point is the gender budgeting that in the budget a certain amount is allocated for women. So gender budgeting started in India. 
एंड लास्ट पॉइंट आई मैंशन इज रिजर्वेशन ऑफ वन थर्ड सीट्स फॉर वुमेन इन पंचायती राज इंस्टीट्यूशन सो दिस अमेंडमेंट सेवेंटी थर्ड अमेंडमेंट इन नाइनटीन नाइनटी टू इट हैज गिवन वन थर्ड सीट्स टू वुमेन बट वी डोंट गेट टू सी सच थिंग फॉर द स्टेट असेंबलीज एंड एंड द पार्लियामेंट नाउ वॉट इज द वे अहेड सो नाउ इन वे अहेड फ्रॉम एजुकेशन टू एम्प्लॉयमेंट टू रिप्रेजेंटेशन टू प्रॉपर्टी राइट्स so this is how i have tried to show you the the movement that has taken place that once the women got educated then they started moving to employment to their representation and now property rights so that is how they are progressing regarding solidarities they should have is one it should start at the level of family to workplace to regional to national to global then only the women move women's movement can be a success so what are the issues the issues are safety at workplace menstrual hygiene affordable crutches because if the women will be working they will need a support system that the child care should be taken place at the workplace it should be such that the children could be taken care of next point is that of role of civil society ngos and the political parties because in most of the cases the political parties are not ready to give their tickets to women and at the max also if they get then sometimes they have to be either they are the wife of uh, some political leader or they are the daughter of some political leader it's not that some independent women will get so there also the political parties have to change their attitude uh next point i have mentioned is everydayness of patriarchy that there is this little like everyday notion of patriarchy the way patriarchy functions because what kind of profession they will go for or uh, till what time they can be outside their family so in a way women are regulated their everydayness so these two points stand point theory and difference feminism it's something that right now it is not possible to go into details maybe you can read about these two because i would quickly like to say a few words on conclusion and the first thing is that there are waves of feminism there is something like global feminism and indian feminism there is time frame issues etc so there have been three three waves of feminism maybe some of you must have heard of then from social reforms to nirbhaya case in the span of almost 200 years we have india has come a long way in terms of women's movement but at the same time there are also limitations of women's movement which i just told you in the previous slide that what are the challenges that they face so now what has happened is that we have moved towards transversal politics what is transversal is that when we will have the whole world as one kind of you can say a cosmic kind of a thing uh, so that has to be an alternative uh, from that of universalistic kind of politics we need to have equality and we cannot just negate it so that is something we need to remember so it will have the issues like mobility whether they can move in the public sphere or not their sexual expressions to their way of dressing what so these are some of the issues that the women's movement have a long way to go when it comes to their safety at the public places to uh, their maternity rights etc so these were the things i wanted to tell you and here i have mentioned some of the references which uh, you can read some of them anupama rao's article the sexual politics of caste violence and ritual uh, archaic then similarly shamila rege's article that the likhit women talk differently so these writings there are some more so writing caste so here i would like to mention that you must read little bit more about caste and gender or the rights that the women had in 19th century and 20th century uh, these last two writings are something that i would like to tell you that you must do uh, the women's movement in india this is one article in the book titled human rights gender and environment which will help you similarly this book by nivedita menon seeing like a feminist is also that you can read so hopefully uh, i hope some some of the things are clear for you by this lecture and uh, when you do these readings it will help you little more so with that i would like to end the lecture thank you so much